How do you pay attention to important things? Uh, like what I mean is, um, what are your tips and tricks for not forgetting stuff? Let's do a little crowdsourcing here this morning. Okay, the iPhone. All right, so you put notes in or, yeah, yeah. What else? <laughs> yes, tell everyone around you and hope somebody reminds you of that thing. Way to go, Tony. Others. Write it out. Write it out in a specific way, just write it out. Calendar. What else? Sticky notes. How many of you put stuff in front of the door the night before so that you know you will not leave without that thing and then you go out the other door and of course, yeah. Repetition, 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 right? Wait, till, say that again, Tony. So feel the pain of forgetting and then try to remember the pain and maybe next time you'll remember. There's lots of things we want to remember, right? There's, there's good things we want to remember, we want, things we want to keep front and center in our minds, things we don't want to miss because it's so important, or we don't want to lapse back into something because we stop doing that, you know, uh, something negative, maybe thoughts, maybe diet, whatever, um, so that we don't let days and months slip by with nary a thought for the thing that we had really wanted not to forget. Anyone with me? Well, as followers of Jesus, there is one very important reality which we want to remember and not to forget, and that is that we are utterly dependent upon God for everything that matters. Utterly dependent on God for everything that matters. That we really do need God, that we require his grace, that we can't function without his power, that we are nothing without his love, that we can do nothing without being connected to him. And we know that, but wow, who has trouble remembering that? Well, today we're engaging our fifth covenant affirmation, an affirmation that I think hits home in a really personal and practical way, or at least it did for me, that as covenanters, we are consciously dependent on the Holy Spirit, that we believe this, that we declare this, that we say this, that we work hard to keep our dependence on the Holy Spirit somewhere at the forefront of our minds, our hearts, or at least that's what we try to do, but I don't know. (laughs) Are you like me? Like days and weeks can go by and you're like, all right, (sighs) have you thought about the Holy Spirit and my dependence upon him? And so we're challenged by that, right? Well, before we can get into what I think is practical questions about how do we remain consciously dependent on the Holy Spirit in our lives, we need to just pause for a moment and remember who the Spirit is. And I think I'll just, you know, I've been trying to read a little bit from this booklet and encouraging you in your small groups in particular to read it aloud and discuss it and read it uh, individually. But this is actually where the little affirmation book, this is where it begins in this section on a conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit. And so I just want to read the first paragraph. The covenant church rooted in historic Christianity affirms one God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit continues the creative work of the Father and the redeeming work of the Son within the life of the church. It is for this reason the covenant church has emphasized the continuing work of the Spirit. And the scriptures speak with one voice on this, on who the Spirit is and how we are to be filled, influenced by, motivated by, changed by, led by God's Holy Spirit. And so I want to invite us just to quieten our hearts and minds for a moment as we listen together to two longer passages about the Holy Spirit, about the Spirit's power and presence in our lives. And so Glenna is going to come and read from Romans chapter 8. She's going to read verses 9 through 16. No, through 17, sorry. And, and then following uh, her, um, Mike is going to come and read uh, Galatians. So go ahead, Glenna. I'm just going to make sure you're speaking nice into the mic. Good morning. I don't want you to have to hunch there. Okay. 
You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give you to you, give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the, the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Thank you. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is the opposite of what the Spirit wants. The Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your, your own good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, I have before that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we were living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoked or provoke one another, or be jealous of one another. Galatians 5, 13 to 26. Thanks, Glenna, and thanks, Mike. There's so much in these two passages, and I'm just going to spend now a couple hours unpacking them for you. <laughs> uh, no. Um, there's a lot more uh, different passages. It's really all over the place, and we spent actually the entire summer on the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, the role of the Holy Spirit, kind of trying to get some sense of who the Holy Spirit is and how the Holy Spirit is active in our lives. So there's actually nine full weeks of teaching on the Holy Spirit that is available to us, uh, available to you, and can be accessed on our website, YouTube, Apple Podcasts. Um, I could re-preach it to you if you'd like. So, you know, it, it, whatever it would take. Uh, but just to say that you can dive into that, the character of the Holy Spirit is the central character of our lives it is God living in us, empowering us, leading us, reforming us. He's recreated us and is now in this monumental task of helping us catch up in reality with what is already true of us in Christ. Big job, but the Holy Spirit is up for it. In so many ways, the central call of every follower of Jesus is the one we just heard right at the end of Galatians chapter 5. 
verse, five, verse 25 of Galatians chapter 5, since we live by the Spirit, thanks Mike, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. My very much loved seminary professor, Dr. Gordon Fee, who just died a couple weeks ago, he believed that the command to be filled with the Spirit or to keep in step with the Spirit, however it was worded, was actually the empowering center of all Christian ethics, of how we live and how we live in relationship and what we do and don't do. That is, that our ability to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves, it depends upon living by the Spirit we've received. It's part and parcel. That in fact, asking the Holy Spirit to fill us, helping us align our lives with the Spirit, to walk in his ways, is the only way we have a hope of actually loving God and loving others. And so much of the New Testament is about helping us get the truth of who we are now in Christ, of who the Spirit has made us to be as new creations, getting that down deep so that we now live by the Spirit, that that's true of us, that this Spirit living expresses that we are living temples of God, walking, talking, presence, and we need to somehow keep that front and center. I think so much of the teaching, particularly of the New Testament, is reminding us of who we already are, right? Remember this. Learn about this. Focus on this. Meditate on who Christ is and what he has done. Enjoy the presence of God in your life. Envision what he has for you. Imbibe deeply of the word of God and revel in the truth of who we are and do that daily and do that weekly and do that constantly because this is how we live by the Spirit. We live, we're not dead. We live, but not in our own power, under our own industry, or by our own intelligence, but by the Spirit. We live by Him. And so with that as our center, with an awareness and a conviction about who God is and what Jesus has done, and now what the Holy Spirit is doing to complete and continue that work, the command is that we would keep in step with the Spirit, that He's the one leading us the way. He's the one initiating. He's the one calling. He's the one shaping. He's the one saying, let's go and do this together. And we want to keep in step with him. And this keeping in step is the daily work of a Christian. Daily life that we follow. It's, it's the very essence of Christian spiritual formation or discipleship or whatever you want to call it. The task of being an apprentice of the master Jesus, of watching what he's doing of learning and observing, thinking, oh, I see what he's done there, and then trying to do it ourselves. But also then bringing others into this apprenticeship, welcoming others into the family so that we can learn together how we apprentice to the master, Jesus. We keep in step with the Spirit so that we are living it out in tangible and practical and totalizing ways, this kingdom vision that God has for us. This is both true personally, your inner life, but it's also true as we think about the wrestling that we have and struggle with in our relationships with each other, where it's hard to figure out how do we keep in step with the Spirit with all these guys around us? Dragging me down, right? Right? Because how many of you feel like, well, I'm trying to keep a step of the Spirit here, but you keep tripping me. Anyone? Am I the only one? Feeling tripped? <laughs> right? So the wrestling we have with, like, okay, I want to keep a step of the Spirit, but man, it's hard. But also as a church, as a, as a, as a, as a even as, a, if you want to say, as a more formal organization, how do we as a church keep in step with the Spirit? At all these levels, this is the call. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And our responsibility is to partner with the Holy Spirit and who he has made us and who he is making us to be. You can see it clear in the challenge. It's, it's not some sort of passive thing. Well, I'll just stand here, God, you just chisel away. It's like, no, the call is to move. And we're responsible to actually get into step behind the Spirit behind Jesus, to follow him. That's our part, our responsibility. And no one can do it for you. No one can do it for me. 
The Holy Spirit initiates, but part of that initiation in his life is to call us into action, to actually move. That's our responsibility. And so the vital question is, how do we do that? How do we keep in step with the Spirit? There's probably a lot of ways you could express this. But you wouldn't be wrong, not far off, by simply saying, how we keep in step with the Spirit is by remaining consciously dependent upon Him. That if we will remember, if we will somehow keep the reality of our dependence on the Spirit front and center and not forget, if we will build things into our lives so that we are practicing that conscious dependence in real tangible ways and in our relationships and in our conversations and in our small groups and in our church and in our families and in our inner life, that if we will somehow remember, hold in front of us, practice it in real ways, our conscious dependence on the Spirit, then we will keep in step with the Spirit. I think that's crucial. Some practical way of being aware of the Spirit's presence and then daily depending on him for direction, for provision, for life, for, for a revelation of who Jesus is, for, for an assurance of our, loved, uh, our being loved by him, uh, for, for peace when we feel anxiety, uh, for some sense of direction when we feel completely unmoored and in the fog, that we simply lay ourselves before the Lord and say, Holy Spirit, I am dependent upon you. It's crucial. There's more in this little booklet I encourage you to read, but I'm going to skip the section I was going to read, and I just want to go right to practice here. How do we grow in this? How do we grow in our conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit? I have some ideas. (laughs) Big shock. But I'd like to start with yours. So when you think of the question, how do I, like, you know, personalize it. How do I grow in conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit? What do you say? How do you do that? Thoughts? Tony, say that again. Through prayer. Yes. Yes, absolutely, Tony. Build Build relationship with the Holy Spirit, with God, which is spending time, right? And, and what, what other things? Like just, let's let's, let's uh, flesh that out a little bit more, Val or, or anyone. What, 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 what do we do to build that relationship? Understand his character and through prayer, treating him like a best friend, there was reading his word. In other words, actually... God isn't just some distant idea or just some character in a book, but a real living person that we come to know through the word of God by the spirit of God. If you um, read the little section in here, one of the aspects of the covenant coming out of the Reformation history is that we understand the word of God and the spirit of God are inseparable. They're always working together in tandem. You don't pull them apart. And we can imagine, and maybe you've experienced some of the problems when you go way to one side, way to the other. Nonsense. They're always working in tandem. They're always working together to reveal the character of God and build that relationship. So the word of God and the spirit of God always inseparably working together to build our relationship with him. How how else do you grow in conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit? What else do you say to that? Time. You have to put in time. There is actually no way around that one, is there? Um, And we know that's true. If you've got a friendship with someone, but you never see them or spend time with them or talk to them or reference them in any way, let me honestly ask you, how much of a relationship do you have? Or maybe to put it more, more directly, how much relationship are you going to have if that's what you do? And we pull back, and you know, you know me, I'm Mr. No Pressure, except for earlier with fundraising. I can do pressure on that. But uh, I'm Mr. No Pressure. I hate people to squirm. But the truth is, like, if we don't spend time building our relationship with God, um, good luck. 
you know, growing in Christ. It's not going to happen. And yet we struggle with that. I struggle with that. Put in the time. We've got to spend time in the word, spend time in prayer, spend time worshiping together in community, spend time walking with friends and spiritual friendship and, and, and mulling over and wrestling through what is the spirit saying? What is God's word saying? We've got to spend time if we're going to grow in our relationship with God. What else? So I need to repeat this for the camera, so correct me, Ken, if I miss this, but the idea of slowing down enough so that we can ask, what are you doing here? How do I, how how should I respond? What should I do? How do we remain attentive? But like, well, you you said something important. Slowing down our lives or maybe um, moving aside distractions enough in our lives that we actually can pause and say, oh, look at what's going on. Holy Spirit, what are you doing here? How do I respond? But often we're moving at such lightning speed or with so much going on in our minds or worse yet, <coughs> in our hands that we, we don't have a moment to even say, oh, wow, Holy Spirit, what are you doing here, right? So that time, that slowing down, the moving distractions aside and asking the question, Holy Spirit, what are you calling me to do or say or engage here? Yeah, what else? Where'd we grow? Jesse. Having the mindset first thing in the morning, including prayer, but specifically you're saying that mindset of like, I am a servant serving a master today. He's got, he's got something for me. I need to be faithful to him today as he's faithful to me. And so having that, like setting your day with that perspective. Um, and what a difference. I mean, how you set your day, the first things you think about, what you spend your time focusing on in those early first moments are, they do shape our day, don't they? And so having that perspective and mindset, so significant. Thanks, Jesse. Anyone else? How do you grow in conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit? I heard two things at once. I heard something about the word, what? To know his words. To, yep, to read it, memorize it, study it. Uh, and then somebody said small group. And so they go together, yeah. So you should re- try to you know, take it, have a daily habit of, of reading or listening to scripture, even if it's just a, a short passage, a reading scripture. But then, oh man, to go the distance and get with a group of people where you can talk about it, pray about it, turn it over, wrestle with it. Um, one of the beautiful things about, about um, our history, even as a covenant church, which we've been exploring, the centrality of God's word, isn't just a th- thing that sits at the top of the you know, constitution, as it were. It's this lived reality. that the, the scripture is at the center of our lives together. And so we orient ourselves around the scripture and the Holy Spirit shapes us and teaches us as we submit to the scripture. And we say, then this is the beautiful thing about being in a small group is, or being with a group of friends talking about it is we're saying, together, how do we submit ourselves to scripture? How do we learn from one another? We had a great conversation in our last small group on Tuesday night where we talked about that in reference to the last one about um, churches of fellowship of believers. We talked about the struggle um, with, you know, um, when there's maybe a challenge that's being given to someone or, or someone's saying to me, like, they're, they're correcting something in my life. Who likes to be corrected? Like, nobody. And then, uh, so then the struggle we have with saying, well, fine then, I'm, uh, I'm just going to go find another church or I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. And how do we try to, how do we lean into each other and say, how do I in love submit to you and you in love submit to me as we are submitted to s- the scripture? Not in a weird way, a heavy-handed way, but in a way that says, together, we're open to the growth that the Holy Spirit wants to bring into our lives. And, and that's going to mean that there's things in my life the Holy Spirit wants to, wants to shave off or grind off or, or change, that he actually wants to use you to do it. And don't you dare renege on your job, because I really like to be more like Jesus. You know what I'm saying? We need each other. And 
somehow in that act of getting together around scripture and saying, where is it written? How do we, how do we learn together as brothers and sisters in Christ and have God's word shape us? That's not only the way the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, but we become more consciously dependent on the Spirit as we, as we do that. Okay, there's more, but let me add a few bits more to this, and then we'll, we'll, we'll close. But uh, I do want to encourage you, just on that note, to, to keep talking about this um, in your small groups. If you don't have a small group, make one. Um, and, you know, take them out for coffee this week and say, you're my small group. Um, and... Uh, and this is what we're talking about. Uh, but when I think of how we now personally and as a church, how do we grow in this conscious awareness of the Holy Spirit? I think the first step is cultivating our awareness of the Spirit. To actually recognize and that we, we the Spirit is present and at work in our lives, around us, and in the world. Like this conviction that the Holy Spirit of God is absolutely present here and with us and actively at work around us. And with that as an assumption, how do I cultivate a greater awareness of that? How do I tune my heart and mind to see? Or my, my friend Renus, he always would say, to notice, name, and nurture the presence of God in our lives. Notice it, name it, and nurture it. It's an important way that we cultivate an awareness of the presence of God in us. And one of the practices that are crucial for this is that we insert daily speed bumps into your life. How good are speed bumps? What do speed bumps do? Slow you down because what's going to happen if you hit that thing hard? You're going to hit your head. Your, 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 your tires are going to come up through the roof of your car. You're going to break your, what are they called, struts? I don't know. Kevin, what are you going to break if you hit it hard? Yeah, well, sure. He says, sure. He says, sure, Tom. you real mechanic, you. Or, or you hit it hard and you fly right over it. That's true. And then you could end up killing somebody. There's speed bumps for a reason. Why slow you down enough to create some safety for others? True. But here's the thing, speed bumps help you in life. When we insert a daily speed bump of some kind, a kind of discipline, some of the things we even talked about when it came to remembering things, that can actually slow us down enough to help us pay attention. This is actually the power of daily spiritual disciplines, particularly spiritual disciplines that are designed to actually get you just to slow down a hair for a moment. Because um, there's a lot of things that are warring against your growth in Christ. And you can think of all of the evil, nasty things that want you groveling in the dirt. But one of the most dangerous things to your, your spiritual growth right now is actually distraction. It's very inane and you don't even notice it. It's it just keep you distracted. Keep you focused on the next thing. And so having some kind of spiritual practices that just get you to pause, to just get you quiet for a moment even, are critical, actually, to our spiritual growth. And so having a spiritual speed bump in your life, I don't know what that might look like. It might look like um, putting your phone away somewhere at night and not going back to it until a certain time in the morning. Some of you are getting hives right now thinking about that. It could be that you actually do intentionally get up a little earlier to just have a few moments of quiet. Some of you already do that, of course. It could be that you, um, you take a moment when you drive into work and you, you park your car. You just take a few moments in your car before you get out to simply pause, pray, maybe do some of what Jesse said, remembering uh, you're a servant of the high king, and today is a day God has given you to follow him and ask for the Holy Spirit to lead you as you do. But to insert some sort of daily speed bump that stops you, slows you down, whether it's something you, you've posted, something you've, you know, you, you, you've created, something that you, you have to get over it before you get to the next thing. I don't know, you can be creative with that, but have some kind of speed bump that slows you down. This is the purpose of practicing silence and solitude. 
It's the purpose of Sabbath, of saying, today I am all gloriously off. And you can dance and celebrate and notice, name, and nurture all you want. Or it's having a nice walk. Or practicing a certain kind of prayer. But we have got to cultivate our awareness of the Spirit. It is so important. I don't think that we're going to get to the conscious dependence part if we're not even able to slow down enough to notice, to be aware. The Holy Spirit is alive and around us, speaking and active. And so my question there practically would be, what's a daily speed bump that could slow you down enough to help you with that? You have to answer that for yourself. Second, then, is that how do we then practically depend on the Holy Spirit? How do we practically depend? In other words, what are the things that we can actually do that help us actually depend on the Holy Spirit's direction, on the Holy Spirit's affirmation, on the Holy Spirit's insight through the word of God. How do we do this in practical ways? And I want, there's a lot of directions we could go with this, but I'm actually thinking about something I I already alluded to it in our our, um, conversation time, that in our small group last week, we talked about how do we be more intentional with each other at the front end? of going to a brother, going to a sister and saying, look, I want to grow in Christ. Will you help? In other words, how do we actually practice, how we practice intentional dependence on the Holy Spirit or conscious dependence on the Holy Spirit, the invitation might be, how do I actually become more dependent on my spiritual community? How do I actually walk with more intentionality with you? And you with me. In other words, how do I come to you and say, I want to grow in Christ and I want to stop just being and living and thinking and growing with, with complete individualistic um, you know, ways of being. I want to somehow start saying, uh, my daily walk, and my weekly walk with Christ, I need to be in tighter uh, connection with a brother or a sister. This is the spiritual friendship thing I've been talking about, but it's more than that. It's, it's part of our daily walk, but it's also part of how we make decisions in life. So many of us live so individualistically that we will make major, earth-shattering, life-changing, trajectory-altering decisions with no other reference point than how I felt on Saturday. I mean that. And I'm speaking about myself here, too. And saying, how do we actually come to each other and begin to, and here's that word we all hate, but I'm just going to use it. How do we begin to actually submit to one another out of reverence for Christ? How do we actually come to brothers and sisters as we're growing in relationship with them and begin to invite them into the ways we're struggling with doubt, uh, the ways we're struggling with a friend, um, the decisions we're mulling? How do we even create in our lives... um, some sort of protections against just going off and making huge changes or huge decisions without ever discussing this with a friend in Christ, without ever bringing it into some sense of discernment together. Uh, This continues to challenge me personally, but it continues to shock me um, as as we look around and see that people sometimes will make massive life-changing decisions and Honestly, and I mean this with all grace, like I don't think they've, not only have they not shared it with someone, I don't think they've prayed about it with someone. I don't think they've ever brought it to a few wise, godly people and said, help me discern together the voice of the Spirit in this. They just made the decision, come what may. And God will be with them and God will hopefully try to make the best he can of the mess. But sometimes it's like, wow, Let's do this together. And so the challenge here that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, as we consciously depend on the Holy Spirit, one of, the, one of the practical ways that we can do that is we can say, let's start actually depending more upon each other. Let's actually say, the Spirit of God is in you, which I know he is. I'm going to actually start walking with a few people more closely. And I'm going to actually start opening up my life and our lives a little more and say, Holy Spirit, let's, let's break that, that siloed kind of individualistic thing. 
And let's actually start to live in community. Let's keep in step with the Spirit together. And I think as we practice that together, there's just no telling what the Holy Spirit might do. As we walk together in spiritual friendship, as we seek to follow the Spirit together. So, as we close, uh, some of you know that I ran my first ultra marathon this last summer. Oh, goodness. Anyway, I, I, ha- I had a thought that came to me. When I was thinking about how this, this idea of being consciously dependent, like, what's that like? It reminded me of my run, which I've tried not to drag out and talk to you guys about too much because nobody likes it when runners always talk about running. Can I get an amen? Um, but when I was running on my ultra, uh, it was many hours long, you know that. And, and it turns out I had trained on Goat Mountain thinking, innocently, that it was about the same, you know? And it was, about the same elevation, and if you do it multiple times, it's about the same distance. So I thought, I've kind of mimicked the trail conditions over at Kimberley around the, the ski resort, similar to the Goat Mountain here. Wrong. This is like a three out of 10, technically, and then a Kimberley was like an 8.7 out of 10, which meant this. It meant for, so I ran for eight hours and for about at least five of those hours. I kid you not, every single step I took, if I was not focused 100% on where my next foot was gonna fall, you know what happened? I fell, that's what happened. Multiple times, by the way. Cut my hand, dirt all over, bloody shins, but nothing compared to some of the other guys that went to the hospital. <laughs> anyway, so what I, what I realized, talk about getting in the flow. So uh, uh, as I'm running, like total focus. So people ask, oh, isn't the, isn't the country beautiful back there? I have no idea. Because if I'd have looked up, it would have been the last scene I saw. I would have fell. I would have fallen. I'm not lying. So I'm on the, you know, the back side of the resort there, and it's glory. the glory's all around, but Tom's only focused on where his next foot's going to fall because if I didn't do that, I was going to bloody myself or worse. And so for those hours, I was focused 100% on where my next foot was going to fall. And actually, it's kind of a beautiful thing. That's, sometimes that's why runners get into this thing. Something about getting in the flow. Time falls away. And there's just, you know, nothing else exists. No troubles in the world except trying not to fall down. And I've realized that there's something in there about this keeping in step with the Spirit, this conscious dependence on the Spirit, that if we do not maintain that kind of focus, we will fall. We will fall. And the thing different, perhaps, than the ultra is, you know, if you fall on the ultra, everyone notices blood, dirt, pain, maybe shame, but pretty much everyone's doing it, so, you know, that's not really a deal. But, but in the Christian life, if we don't maintain focus, we might fall but not notice it. You know what I'm saying? that falling will just look more like a subtle drift or a slight wane, a heart getting a little colder, relationships getting a little more distant, Um, just our minds being filled with things other than, and suddenly days and weeks go by and we realize, I haven't actually paused and looked around and said, Holy Spirit, you're at work here. Reveal yourself to me. I haven't actually been in the word of God and letting the Holy Spirit shape me. So if we aren't staying consciously dependent, if we aren't looking to where our next foot's going to fall, as we keep in step with the Spirit, we will drift. We will fall. But the tragedy is we may not even know it. And the conscious dependence that we must have in the Holy Spirit is this kind of dependence that says, I am sticking with Jesus. Because if I don't, I will fall. And that tragedy will be greater than Tom falling on some, the backside of some mountain, even if no one did find him back there. Be way way more tragic than that. And so to keep in step with the Spirit, to maintain that kind of intensity that says, my life (laughs) depends upon where my next foot falls, Lord. Jesus, help me land it right. We need that kind of conscious dependence 
on the Holy Spirit. And so as we close today, I just want to invite you into a moment of reflection and prayer together. I invite you to close your eyes, and I will too, to close your eyes. And if you're uh, open to this, to just simply hold out your hands in an open posture, or resting on your lap or, or up, up, up a little bit, whatever is comfortable for you, to hold your hands out for just a moment. This is a sign of our receptivity to the Holy Spirit. And so for just a moment, let's quieten our hearts and minds with our hands open, with our hearts open. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Holy Spirit of God, we live by you. In this quiet moment, whatever it is that has been blocking us, whatever it is that's been holding us back, whatever's been distracting us, we offer that to you. We are frail. We are forgetful. We offer that to you. And we thank you for your life in us, for the new creation power that you have given to us. We live by you. We live by the Spirit. And with open hands, Holy Spirit, we want to keep in step with you. And we ask, as a congregation, as families, as friends, as brothers and sisters, men, women, children, we ask that you would help us, that you would empower us, that you would fill us, and that we together would keep in step with you. Holy Spirit, would you teach us in this week ahead, in this month ahead, teach us practical, concrete ways that we can consciously depend upon you. That we can cultivate awareness of your presence and get into step. We hold ourselves open to you, asking for your filling, asking for your healing, asking for your correction, asking for your power knowing that we are loved, forgiven, and yours. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.